If you imagine if you had a developing brain that had just formed some gyri and sulci on its top surface, if you then dissected out the cerebral cortex, the top layer, and it relaxed to being a flat thing, you would then know it was only folded because it was held in that configuration. Whereas if when you dissect it out, it remained in its complicated folded shape, then the idea it was having that because it was being constrained wouldn't really make any sense. So that's the kind of gold standard uh, evidence, uh, is, is dissection evidence. The other thing you can do is uh, look for a match. So uh, you solve the elasticity problem or the mechanics problem and you see what shape it predicts and you see how well it matches the observed structure um, and how much of it it can explain. Um, and so what we saw is that the physical model explains, for example, the size of the folds uh, across the entire animal kingdom. Um, and so that was kind of quite strong evidence that this was the right way of thinking about it. And the one other thing I would say, which I think is kind of quite strong evidence, um, although, well, no, it's not argument, it's not evidence, um, is that the cases where we know that instabilities are important, these are cases where we can also tell an interesting evolutionary story, where we can see why... In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dweeney, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find Science Robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about the research. Thanks Science Robotics for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. So I'd like to first, how would you like to define yourself? Uh, oh, well, I mean, professionally, I, I would say that I am a scientist and an engineer. Um, I, uh, I've had quite a round route into where I finished up, I would say. So I, I, I trained actually in theoretical physics. Um, uh, started life in statistical mechanics and then became more interested in continuum mechanics. Uh, I spent quite a long time actually working on biological problems. So looking at how uh, you can think about tissues as soft materials and how they have mechanics and they buckle and they wrinkle and they fold. Uh, um, and then latterly I've moved into the engineering department uh, and I'm now interested in uh, active soft materials, uh, liquid crystal rubbers, which are uh, materials which kind of engineering materials that you can make change shape. Um, and so that's been sort of my, my, my route through my career so far. And so I think uh, I'm increasingly moving from scientist to engineer. I sort of now work in the engineering department, um, uh, but I'm still, I'm still getting there, I think. So I found your work uh, very interesting, especially in elastic instability. And before going to that, I'm curious about your start in physics and now in engineering. And you are really most known for the chain fountain. And I found this sort of something similar to soft robotic using soft and hard parts and how the shape and distance so explains this phenomena. Uh, yeah, no, no. So I think, I mean, obviously the chain fountain is not in the most straightforward sense soft. Uh, the components, I mean, it's a chain, but it's a rigid chain. Um, uh, but um, certainly where I see, I mean, so I, I, uh, I call a lot of work what I do soft materials and soft mechanics. And what I normally mean by that is that things would have a very large element of geometry, things that really change shape dramatically. Um, and I think uh, that sort of soft mechanics can encompass soft materials where you can stretch it by 100 or 200 percent. But it could also encompass, for example, a buckling beam, which is actually almost inextensible. But the difference between being bent in half and not bent is a huge shape change. Um, and uh, the shape of a chain fountain is clearly, again, the emergence of a very interesting, uh, unusual shape. Uh, and so this is all combined, I think, in some sense, by the language of geometry and how uh, mechanics plus geometry gives you these really cool, interesting shape changes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and I'm curious how that led you to elastic instabilities and the shape and geometry. 
Can you tell us more about the transition to deep dive in elastic instability and explain what elastic instability means here? Okay, right, yes. So, um, an elastic instability, uh, there are various forms, but the, the simplest version is you have some sort of elastic body and you apply some sort of deformation to it, something very simple, you compress it or you extend it, and at first what will happen is that it just follows that uh, applied deformation. So you push it and it gets a bit shorter. But then past a certain threshold, it will transition into some completely different shape, and that's an elastic instability. The so really classic example is Euler buckling. So you have a column and you push on it, and at first it gets a little bit shorter, and then once you push a certain amount, it buckles outwards dramatically. Um, but there are many, many more examples than just that. So, for example, one I've been working on recently is the ballooning instability. If you have a cylindrical party balloon and you start to inflate it, then at first it inflates homogeneously, but then once you inflate it past a certain threshold, what you'll see is actually it inflates at one end and not the other. And then this bulge kind of propagates down the balloon as you continue to inflate it. Um, and it starts to have this kind of string of sausages type morphology. Uh, and you can try that with any party balloon of your own. Um, and so... Uh, I'm very interested in elastic instabilities, but for me what I've been interested in is the connection between elastic instabilities and soft materials. So normally elastic instabilities, like buckling, have been thought about as failure modes. Because if you've got a stiff material and you go through a big dramatic shape change with instability, it normally snaps or it fractures, it breaks, and that's the end of the story. But with a soft material, one that can sustain a very large strain, something like rubber or skin or brain tissue, you could undergo a huge strain like that and survive. And suddenly that makes these instabilities interesting, useful things, rather, uh, which you can use to achieve interesting shape changes, rather than something you're only trying to avoid. Um, and what's more, um, these things are all rooted in geometry, and if you've got the ability to change shape a lot, then also you get a whole set of new instabilities. And there's a twofold reason why do you, soft materials and instabilities is a good combination. You have more and more interesting instabilities, and you survive them, so they're useful. Um, and so uh, I actually started in this line in biology. So I was trying to understand how organs develop. Um, that was kind of the question. Um, and we realised you know, there was an intersection between that question and mechanics, where several organs uh, develop their complicated shapes by using elastic instabilities. Um, and the one I've studied the most is the brain. Um, so the brain has this wonderful convoluted outside shape, like we all know that shape. And the question is in developmental biology, where does that shape come from? How do you achieve that shape? Um, and there are all sorts of complicated theories out there. And to give you some sense of it, like a standard biological theory would be that some chemistry happens on the surface of the developing brain which says, here will be mountains and here will be valleys. And then the mountains grow more and the valleys grow less, and that gives you rise to the complex shape. Um, but what we put forward was an alternative proposal where we said, OK, the, the brain is basically a layered structure. It's all soft, solid material, but it's layered. The outside layer called the cerebral cortex is quite distinct to what's inside. Um, and what happens is the outside layer simply grows and gets bigger, but homogeneously. So if you imagine that the brain were a sphere, then that spherical shell on the outside that's growing, if it was dissected away and it was growing without being adhered to the inside material, it would just turn into a bigger sphere. But because it is tethered to the inside material, then it buckles and crumples, and that's an elastic instability from which this wonderful convoluted shape emerges. And there's a kind of a theory there, one of the useful things, not theory, uh, a feature there, a recurring feature, which is that one of the cool things about elastic instabilities is that they make shapes that are more complicated. So it's a transition from a simple shape to a complicated shape, always. Um, and so it gives you a route to move uh, in application uh, or in developmental biology from a simple shape to a more complicated shape. Um, there are not um, so many examples in engineering yet of elastic instabilities that are really fine application. Um, uh, but, for example, we're very interested at the moment in the idea that these surface instabilities, things like wrinkling and buckling on surfaces that make wrinkles, can be used to change things like wettability or optical properties. If you can develop a surface texture, then that can change all sorts of interesting properties of the surface. Um, uh, and uh, I can give you one other really nice example. Uh, this is actually not a soft material example of a elastic instability, but is in use. Uh, so if you're, if you're British, you drink a lot of tea and you have a kettle. And the thermostat in your kettle is uh, an elastically unstable object. So it's a bimetallic dome 
So it's a dome with uh, two different metals, one on the outside and one on the inside. And then, you know a bimetallic strip, when it heats up, will bend. Well, a bimetallic dome, when it heats up, will sit there, and then at a certain temperature, it pops, and it flips through to being the other way up. And that's what turns your kettle off. It gives you a clean cut in the electric current, so you don't get sparks and so forth, uh, when you hit the critical temperature. Um, uh, but yes, there you go, that's a long answer. But yes, so elastic instabilities uh, and soft materials. Uh, for me, it really started in biology, um, uh, and now is pushing through into engineering. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I would like to go back to the argument. You already s argued that the, the, the shape already, the folds in the human brain is much simpler, and that's what you argue about. If you can tell more about how you make sure this assumption is true, the, the formation of the shape, especially if we speak in biological terms here, how you make sure the understanding, the explanation is really um, maybe true. Yeah, no, so... Uh, so, there are different things you can do. The kind of gold standard evidence, which I must honestly admit is not currently in place for the brain, uh, but it is in place for some other systems, um, is you do a dissection experiment during development. Um, and so, if you imagine if you had a developing brain that had just formed some gyri and sulci on its top surface, if you then dissected out the cerebral cortex, the top layer, and it relaxed to being a flat thing, you would then know it was only folded because it was held in that configuration. Whereas if when you dissect it out, it remained in its complicated folded shape, then the idea it was having that because it was being constrained wouldn't really make any sense. So that's the kind of gold standard uh, evidence, uh, is, is dissection evidence. Um, uh, and there is good evidence of that type, for example, from the looping of the gut and the development of villi in the gut, although the evidence in the brain, um, well, it's much harder to do experiments on the brain roughly speaking. These, these convoluted brains only form in animals that you don't really want to do experiments on. Um, um, the other thing you can do is uh, look for a match. So uh, you solve the elasticity problem or the mechanics problem and you see what shape it predicts and you see how well it matches the observed structure um, and how much of it it can explain. Um, and so what we saw is that the physical model explains, for example, the size of the folds uh, across the entire animal kingdom. Um, and so that was kind of quite strong evidence that this was the right way of thinking about it. Um, uh, and another nice feature is that the more accurate you make the model, um, which in our case would say the more of the kind of brain geometry you put into it. So, so your brain's not a sphere, it's maybe more like a rugby ball shape. And actually it's a bit, no. And, and the more of that kind of actual geometry of the brain you put in, you start to recover features in the folding pattern that you would expect to see. So everyone has the big fold down the middle, everyone has a fold here and here, and you find that as you match the macroscopic geometry of the brain, the instability then starts to produce features you would hope to see. So that's quite suggestive. Um, and the one other thing I would say, which I think is kind of quite strong evidence, um, although, well, no, it's not argument, it's not evidence, um, is that the cases where we know that instabilities are important, these are cases where we can also tell an interesting evolutionary story, where we can see why that might be how it is. Um, so uh, in all these cases, the Im evolutionary imperative is basically to make something bigger, and it's got to continue to fit. Um, so in the case of the brain, uh, the way the brain is wired, um, the cerebral cortex, which is the out your brain, is primitive on the inside and gets more sophisticated as you move out. Um, and the outer layer of the brain, the cerebral cortex, um, is where you do all of your higher level thinking. Uh, and so if you want to be very smart, you need a very big cerebral cortex. Um, but the thickness of the cerebral cortex is fixed. So the way the brain is wired, the cerebral cortex itself is kind of six layers thick, which makes one processing unit. And then, uh, so to make it big, you have to make it have a bigger area. And so the evolutionary imperative to be smart is therefore to make a cerebral cortex with a big area. And if you just do that, if you just kind of crank up genes to make more cerebral cortex and don't do anything else, it will grow homogeneously and you will get this buckling. Um, and you see the same thing. And so, for example, you can do that. You can do that in a mouse. You can turn up genes that create more proliferation of cerebral cortex. And the brain folds up beautifully, just like our brain, even though there's no regulation of folded brains that anywhere in a mouse is kind of evolutionary history. And so that kind of suggests, again, that this is really what's going on. Maybe a quick question, Hina, about the morphology or the shape. How we make sure the shape selected may be meaningful? 
maybe the other question is if someone asking you we have now the elastic instability and we have the soft material and we have this geometrical shape if you mix these together the material and geometry which one is more dominant or significant to access this interesting elastic instability in I, this is not a universal answer but in the materials that i work on and the work i have done um we work on very very simple materials um, so the material model we use is what's called the new hookian model nearly always which is the very most basic elastic model you can use that is sensible for large deformations. Um, and so all of the reason why the instability is happening and how the instability is happening is not traced back to the elastic behavior, which is a very simple, sensible model. Um, it's traced back to the geometry. Um, and uh, that's also seen across all sorts of other instabilities, right? So I mean, the buckling of a beam, for example, is extremely insensitive to what material it's made out of. Uh, nearly all beams will buckle into a sinusoidal shape unless you use something really complicated as a material um, because the sinusoidal shape is chosen as a bending minimum by geometry. Um, so in nearly everything we do, the shape that emerges comes from geometry and therefore is moderately universal. Um, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's independent of the underlying material, but it's only very weakly dependent on the underlying material. Um, the caveat there is that these in, uh, some of these instabilities require large strains before they are triggered. And so you do require materials that can sustain a big enough strain to survive the instability and happen. Right? So the, um, if you think about the ballooning instability that I talked about earlier, um, right? uh, that's a completely geometric effect, basically. Um, but of course, you do need a rubbery material that can undergo. So it has... Uh, uh, so, I mean, the, the, the essence of the ballooning instability is that as you inflate the balloon, the walls get thinner, which means they're less able to sustain pressure. And so at some point, um, uh, actually, the pressure volume curve starts to go down, where uh, when you increase the volume, the pressure goes down because the walls are getting thinner and thinner and thinner. That's the purely geometric effect. It's kind of universal in all materials. But it's only going to be seen to cause the ballooning instability materials that can stretch enough to make it important to get into that downhill region. Mm -hmm. So maybe the question here, how we make sure to access elastic instability? Maybe it is a limitation to certain geometry or material. Maybe the other way, if I want to notice this interesting behavior, do you think there's certain shape that can leverage elastic instability? Or maybe mechanics, if you explain it, this was interesting, this kind of shape. For example, geometric nonlinearities. I found it very fascinating how they can really change the functionality you're looking for. I don't know what, what do you thought about that? I, so, anyway, sorry, let me just think about that. So I think the, anyway, the first thing to say as a kind of just very zoomed out thing is that uh, geometric nonlinearities and this kind of complex mechanics are much easier to achieve in thin bodies than in kind of fully three-dimensional bodies. Um, so you only really see instabilities in fully three-dimensional bodies in very soft materials, uh, whereas in very thin bodies, you could see all sorts of buckling and wrinkling uh, associated with plates and shells and rods. Uh, and so um, you, uh, yes, you can get dramatic shape changes much more straightforwardly if at least one dimension is slender. Uh, and so that's a clear coupling between the geometry and the instabilities. Um, uh, the ballooning instability as well, which is a membrane instability. Um, I... Um, can you, given an instability, kind of tune the instability by tuning the geometry? Absolutely, right? Um, uh, and I mean, that happens um, uh, in, um, I mean, that happens kind of across the board. Uh, and so, I mean, going right back to classic problems, uh, for example, you can ask yourself, how should I change the cross section of a beam um, to change what load it buckles at? What is the cross section of the beam that gives me the maximum buckling load? And that's actually a remarkably complicated question. Um, it turns out I think it's a kind of cos squared cross section gives you the absolutely biggest buckling load. Or you could look for the minimum buckling load. Or can you, for example, by modulating the shape of the beam along its length, choose the shape of the buckling load? And you surely can. Um, so uh, you could definitely tune and tweak these instabilities by tuning and tweaking the macroscopic geometry. Um, but actually, 
I mean, and so the reason why I think I'm, 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 I'm not being as eloquent here as I might like is that uh, in my experience and in most of my own work, the emphasis has all been on taking the simplest possible geometry. Um, uh, so uh, the simplest possible geometry you hope that you can find the instability in offers you a way to actually treat the instability in its simplest form and therefore gain kind of the deepest understanding of it is my normal way of thinking. Right? You've got the best chance of actually understanding it analytically or via very simple computation. Um, whereas the more kind of complex geometry you throw in, so starting geometry, um, the more you're going to be resting on computation to predict exactly what's going to happen. Um, uh, um, therein, I think, probably does lie a little bit of my bias to, no, but I started in science and I'm moving towards engineering. Engineers are not afraid of complex target geometries, uh, whereas uh, I, I see that as kind of a, a, a complexity to push under the rug uh, to deliver the simplest possible treatment of the, of the phenomena. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's start again in the design, the way you start design, let's design the material in this certain shape. And before that, because I, to be honest, I feel sometimes I'm myself confused and have discussion, people confusing the definition of topology and morphology and shape. And even myself, maybe I have a, a maybe not appropriate understanding of uh, topology and morphology because there is conflation sometimes. Maybe you can elaborate more what's the difference and the question is, again, about the design, starting with the shape design. It's kind of starting by intuition, and then how do you define the complex shape, evolving the shape? So basically, I, you have the intuition that shape will, for example, reduce the stresses, or this, or this architecture will reduce stresses. And then how you move forward? What, what are other possibilities? What are other shapes? What are other presentation for the material and the structure? Yeah, no, okay, so I think, so let me say, hey, firstly, on the difference between morphology and topology. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, morphology is just a fancy word for shape, uh, I think. Uh, I mean, morph is Greek for shape. I don't think there's really more to it than that. Um, topology is a more uh, nebulous concept, right? So we, we call things topological basically when they're discrete. So when... Uh, kind of smooth changes in your system don't cause that thing to change. And that, that sounds very abstract, but it's not very abstract. When you, when you have an example, it's quite concrete. So uh, a good example of topology would be how many holes you have, right? And so then how many holes there are in a sheet is a discrete thing. It's one, two, three, four, five. And it doesn't matter how you stretch or pull the sheet, there will always be five. That's what makes it kind of a topological thing rather than a shape thing. Um, unless it tears, and tearing would be a good example where kind of mechanics can lead to a change in topology, uh, but it requires some sort of dramatic disaster. Um, in uh, instabilities, um, uh, most of the instabilities I can think of do not change topology, um, but there are instabilities that change topology. For example, there is an instability called solid cavitation, where you have a solid, like I'm, I'm just a lump of solid, macroscopic, and you, you put it into uh, equal tension in every direction. So you basically pull on it, or you give it kind of a negative pressure, so it's trying, to, it's trying to get bigger. But it can't get bigger, because it's, it's a lump of a given size. Um, and there is, uh, I think you have to apply a negative pressure on the outside of, if I remember rightly, five halves of the shear modulus, or something like that, and then it will spontaneously cavitate in the middle, and you will get a hole at here. Um, uh, and so that would be an example of an instability which does change topology. Um, but most of the instabilities we look at do not change topology. Uh, they exist in a given specified geometry and they change the shape within that. Um, the work on instabilities is where you have very simple program shape changes. For example, you have a layer that's getting bigger and it's attached to a substrate that isn't getting bigger. Right? Very simple. Um, but then mechanics, nevertheless, delivers a complex shape change. It wrinkles, it buckles, it does something interesting. Um, uh, and in those cases, you have a relatively limited set of target geometries that you can achieve, because you aren't really choosing that yourself. The instability chooses the final geometry. Um, and although there's, don't get me wrong, there's, there's quite a nice big zoo of things that can be done, but it's by no means infinite. Um, uh, and it's quite hard to design it. Um, because uh, 
it's really mechanics rather than you as a designer that's choosing what the shape turns into. Um, uh, in contrast, there is another way of going from one shape to another, which is to have some sort of programmed shape change throughout the material. So you could have a material which swells differently at different places or contracts differently at different places or grows differently at different places. And that would be a way of programming a complex shape change into a block of material. Um, and in biology, we see this happening too. Right? That's actually sometimes the more default. The instabilities are a bit exotic. The more default way of getting a complicated shape change in biology would be by programming a spatially varying growth field. Um, and the way we, of course, we actuate, right? the way we move, is by uh, having muscles and then some of them contract and some of them don't, which is a spatially varying contraction field. Um, and so the liquid crystal elastomers I work on are a nice example of an engineering analogue of that. It's a material which has an alignment direction in it, um, a soft material with an alignment direction in it, and when you heat it up, it contracts along that alignment direction. Right? And then, um, we're kind of jumping straight to over many points here, you can then have ways to make a sheet of solid, for example, where you... Uh, you have not just a single alignment direction, but you program that spatially. So that different points in the material have different alignment directions. And then when you activate the material, you get different contraction directions and you get a complex shape change. And so um, that's also very close to my heart. It's something I, in fact, is right at this very moment is what I do most of my work on. Um, uh, but it's mostly not a question of instabilities. There you are actually programming. And so there you really do have a concrete sense of a target outcome, and then you have to design your inputs to get the output that you want. Um, and my, uh, my philosophy in that has been very much that uh, I've been avoiding the kind of grand question of, given a sheet, uh, how do I program this contraction direction in it to get some arbitrary surface? because I think actually arbitrary surfaces are not that interesting. Um, and instead, I've been trying to tie that to how do you get shape transitions that do interesting mechanical work? So how do you push? How do you pull? How do you have like apertures and irises and this kind of question? Um, and so I've been trying to tie... Um, yeah, so rather than look at very complicated geometry changes, I've actually been looking at kind of quite simple geometry changes. Um, uh, uh, but simple geometry changes in different categories that are kind of qualitatively different and for different things. Um, uh, and I've been trying to kind of uh, uh, categorise you know, the different things that one can achieve. Um, uh, and so the, the quintessential example is that you can push. Right? So it's quite hard for a sheet to push. But if the sheet develops into a cone, uh, and we know how to do that, that just requires concentric circles of contraction, then the cone really can push. Um, and for me, the optimization there, the kind of engineering optimization, is not to say, how do I make a cone? It's to say, how do I make a sheet that can push? Um, and then to optimize over possible shapes and possible ways of having pattern of contraction to achieve not the shape that is of interest, but the mechanics and the mechanical actuation that is of interest. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. So the question again, I may be going back to geometric nonlinearities and material nonlinearities. And I think the example of the dead fish swimming upstream is very interesting um, how this coupling of the material and geometric nonlinearities in the environment can give an interesting behavior. Have you ever thought about that already, how this behavior happening without having any kind of maybe uh, neurons? So just slowly based in the body, the shape and morphology of the body. So this is a great question, I think. Um, and I think it's a question that we don't have a, uh, we don't have any kind of systematic way of answering, um, as far as I can make out. So um, I think, you know, a lot of us share the intuition that um, the softness of the body you know, is a essential feature of our ability to function. Um, and, uh, no, is an essential shortcoming um, in kind of our earliest attempt to mimic this functionality. Um, but exactly what it is about the softness that's really enabling 
I mean, and this is where I want to be a bit careful. I'm on a soft robotics podcast and I'm actually not a soft roboticist. And that's probably coming across quite strongly now. Right? I'm a soft matter engineer, but I don't actually make robots. Um, uh, it's not actually clear to me what the unique properties of the soft materials are that are really relevant. Um, it's, you know, there are suggestions to me that you know, it's perhaps something about slow dynamics. So soft materials typically have slow and long wavelength dynamics, uh, whereas um, stiff materials typically have you know, high frequency dynamics um, uh, and perhaps shorter wavelength dynamics. Um, it's something about noise. So something about the inherent ability to deal with noise and compliance um, is part of how a soft material is able to navigate a landscape that contains lots of noise and be okay with that. Um, I, and then maybe it's something about computation. You know, there is some sense in which soft materials are able to kind of solve problems um, uh, and incorporate uh, you know, incorporate feedback from the environment into how they actually move or actuate. Um, but in my opinion, at least, these things are still quite vague. Um, uh, I do not have a very clear sense of what is the dramatically important design feature of soft materials that enables um, uh, you know, things like human walking. Um, I of course, I mean, I will say, in terms of motivation for soft robotics, there's an orthogonal motivation, which is simply to be biocompatible. Um, uh, like, you know, handling soft objects and whatever else. Um, and that's very well motivated, and that's about compliance matching, right? You want to have similar level of softness between, you know, between the different things. Um, but that's, I don't think that is not all there is to it. Um, there is something much more to it than that. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I don't really know what the answer is. Um, uh, it's interesting, actually. I've been working recently on a kind of review paper on elastic instabilities in soft materials. Um, and in the last section, we were thinking about some of these questions, kind of, you know, what, where is the future? What, what is the point of all this? And where is it going? And we've been kind of going around exactly this space about um, uh, what is the real kind of heart of the matter for why soft materials are important in these applications? Um, and at the moment, I don't have a completely satisfactory answer. I'm convinced that they are very important. Um, but exactly why they are very important, um, you know, what the key features are, I'm still somewhat uh, uh, unclear on, I think I'd say. I first ask you if you in combine different classes of material, like stiff and soft. Since you mentioned at the beginning how organs, for example, clearly there is an inspiration how some creature have this combination of soft and hard for many reasons, like higher toughness, body armor, and that's fascinating. For you, have you thought about what if we combine different classes of material? I don't know, maybe for elastic instability, shape programming, I'm just making up so. But I'm curious the perspective of adding significantly different materials, maybe mechanically, whatever the variation. Oh, yeah, no, no. Materials. So that's um, in the current work on liquid crystal rubbers, um, where we're trying to make active materials and then active structures. Uh, absolutely. We are currently actively engaged in trying to do multi-material uh, structures. Um, uh, that seems to be an idea that is quite straightforwardly facilitated um, by 3D printing. Uh, these materials are quite 3D printable and so are lots of other things. And that provides a way of making you know, quite sophisticated multi-material structures. Um, and uh, for me, in the first instance, right, you're exactly right, right? The, the first thing is stiff and soft. Um, we see stiff and soft everywhere in biology, um, right? No, muscle and bone, whatever, right? Um, and uh, it would be good to be able to mimic that. Um, and um, I mean, a lot of mechanics is done by antagonism. Um, uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the, your, your ability to kind of do that gets dramatically bigger if you have uh, you know, materials with different properties that can be kind of juxtaposed and joined together. Um, uh, so yeah, no, so I, I, there was not much of that being done so far in the kind of active material community. Um, 
I think that's really a legacy of the fact that they've been a bit too difficult to make. So simply making the material itself was the achievement. And we are now really moving into a world where, you know, it's easy enough to make it can become a component in another structure. Um, uh, and um, uh, the two, well, I, so we've already talked about stiff and soft. And the other thing, of course, is just active and passive. Um, so um, and to give a simple example of that, right, so when you 3D print a liquid crystal elastomer thing, the first thing you kind of print is some sort of three-dimensional framework. And so each of this strut of this framework is going to have a contraction direction along the strut. And so when you activate it, every strut gets shorter and the whole thing just gets smaller. And that's not super interesting. Right? It's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a bit cool, right? It does, it, it's, it's a big shape change, but it's still the same shape, it's just smaller. Um, whereas if you can put in that some struts are passive and some struts are active, then suddenly it can warp and twist and do all sorts of cool things when it activates as these different bits fight against each other. Um, and so I think, um, actually for me at the moment, it's about active and soft combined with passive and stiff. Uh, and that seems to be the, the sweet spot for getting some really cool kind of uh, transforming structures. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you think in that case, uh, I'm just curious about the design, for example, we have voxel cat. I, I, I don't know if you heard about voxels, or I assume you are already. Do you think that some structure doesn't make sense to you uh, when you look that, since you mentioned that's not interesting, or oh, that's interesting. Do you think this combination sometimes doesn't make sense and maybe that's approach more, make, make, make more sense? I don't know what to view about the approaches that taken in the design space, like voxels, or maybe in the case of just continuum shape and using the specific and soft, for example, passive steps, right? Yeah. I don't think I have much to say about voxels. Um, I think the, the, the idea of a voxel is very clear to me. Um, uh, but as a, certainly, well, certainly in the work that we do, they're not much of a fabrication strategy. Um, uh, we are limited really to kind of more extrusion based techniques. Um, uh, and the, the difficult thing is that there is inherently a coupling between the extrusion line and the contraction direction. Um, and that requires a bit of a different mindset than just kind of filling a three dimensional volume with voxels. Uh, you, could, you can design it in your head, but you don't immediately in our work have a fabrication strategy to implement that. Uh, now I'm sure that's not true in other lines of work, uh, but in the line of work I work in, um, uh, that's basically correct. Um, and so we haven't interacted with that very much. Um, I, so I think a lot of what's interesting in a lot of this is uh, where the balance is between smart materials on the one hand uh, versus smart structures. And so there's the opportunity to move intelligence in these designs up and down between from no, from structure to material or to an external processor off, right? And so to give a very simple example of that, um, uh, really high level adaptive kind of material behavior requires some sense of memory. It's gonna to have to know what it's seen before to change what it's going to do again. And so how do you get a concept of memory? And there are different ways you can do that. So you can try and do it on a material level. You can have fatigue or wear or plasticity. And these are things that make permanent changes to the material which can serve as a memory. Or you can do something more explicit, right? You can have in it you know, chemicals that polymerize or nanoparticle vesicles that explode to release something at certain moments irreversibly. Right, so there are all sorts of irreversible material processes that you can use to endow a material with memory. Or you can do it structurally. So you can say that I'm going to design a structure which has, for example, snapping instability. So if I have a dome that can pop up or can pop down, that forms as a little memory bit um, that will, you know, that could be set and reset. Or you can say, all I need is an active material and I'm going to connect it to a computer controller, and the computer controller has a, seam, has a memory in it. Um, 
And so kind of trying to figure out where the right place is between material structure and just link it up to a computer um, uh, for, for building these kind of more advanced material functions um, like memory or processing or problem solving or learning um, uh, is a very interesting question, I think. And I think these, I mean, we, have, we certainly have no idea what the answer to this is. Um, uh, and a lot of us are engaged, I mean, of the, I'm engaged on the structure part because that's kind of what I do. It builds on instabilities. Um, but I know my, 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 the, the LCE community now contains many people who are interested on the materials end. Um, and in the software bodies community, it's still mostly coming at the computer end. Um, uh, and at some point, there's going to be some sort of convergence between these strands. Um, and, and we will see you know, kind of what works where. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very excellent point. And I was about to ask you, maybe in long term, do you think this space of what's significant to you, this material part, structure, or uh, connecting to being more intelligent, but the computer side, but maybe a focus on the material part and structure, and clearly for you, the structure more significant now, if I understood. So uh, when we look to soft robotics, I don't know what's your view, because I think now you can exhibit intelligence in material level, and there's people from mechanics side, but still not fully in soft robotics, exhibit like yourself, exhibit intelligence to structure. So in the long term, do you think which, which one can be more significant? Do you think both should be aligned or um, maybe in other sense, how we can push the limit of intelligent structure? Because it seems very interesting and how magically different materials or even one material play with geometry can give you interesting feature. Do you think we understand that or which one is so challenging, so hard? Uh, I, I don't think we understand it kind of at all, actually. I think we're miles away. Um, and I think, uh, in, I mean, this is a kind of lazy answer, right? In terms of which one's going to win, they're all going to win. Um, and I, I say that with moderate confidence um, uh, based on looking at biology. And what we see really in biology, where we have, you know, kind of, something you might really talk about as kind of intelligent, adaptive, responsive, learning, every other buzzword, matter, right? It really is that. Um, is that it's hierarchical. Um, it's always hierarchical. Um, and uh, it, in fact, contains these fun the same functions, right, of responsiveness and memory and so forth at different length scales within the material and within the structure and within the organism um, differently. Um, and... Uh, we would be very foolish to bet that the ultimate answer here will not also resemble that. Um, uh, there will be a role uh, likely for combining these hierarchically you know, inside you know, much more sophisticated structures, well, no, not structures, robots, right? Actual kind of organism type of things, um, uh, which, uh, um, which will combine you know, many different levels of, of learning and responsive intelligence. Um, I, um, for sure, we are always going to have the central computer. Uh, I think that seems, I mean, there, would be, there would be some very simple examples where you, where you could actually get away from that entirely. But I don't think the most you know, moderately sophisticated tasks that will be able to be completely sidelined. Um, but uh, large amounts of the more basic uh, but kind of high data processing that's kind of closer to the sensor and closer to the actual environment may well be done in material or in structure so that the, the actual processor is only dealing with much smaller amounts of information uh, much more economically, kind of already filtered and processed and captured and reduced to what it kind of needs to know. Um, uh, and I, I say that based mostly on looking at how biology does it, rather than uh, any clarity on how we are going to get there from where we are right now. <laughs> yeah. And I'm curious, do you have any moments in this research in general, maybe it was counterintuitive, a very, very intriguing moment. You have this moment, wow, I didn't so that will work in that way or maybe surprising this behavior and then you try to find the mechanics explanation it will be very rich i don't know if you have any moments like this counterintuitive to intuition or maybe very interesting uh, oh uh, let me think if i have a good one i um wait 
the in we have we have little such moments all the time um i kind of really big such moments moments that uh you know that kind of leave a long lasting impression on you um i think though looking back on my work uh there were a couple of kind of realizations I mean, these are both actually ultimately theory realizations um although they're absolutely you know in the physical system too um uh I, there was a moment where we realized that a surface instability you know be it buckling or wrinkling or folding or whatever else um was basically always going to make hexagons and that like the preference for hexagons transcended the mechanics that was giving rise to the instability entirely um uh, that was a real surprise for me um i'm not sure it's a surprise to everyone but when we realized that that was a real surprise i thought that was going to be a very rich and interesting area and then it transpired the answer was no it's always hexagons um uh and uh there are other similar examples of that where things have turned out to be much simpler than we expected um where uh, i mean i guess you know that's that's my theoretical physics roots coming through right i love simplicity when something turns out to be much simpler than you were expecting you're like oh wow that's really interesting and that's really you know, i feel like i've done something there um uh so for example i mean this is we haven't really talked much about this but i did work on what's called the rally plateau instability in solids which is where surface tension causes them to change shape um and the mathematics of that appeared to be really rather complicated um and we, we could kind of do it but it wasn't it wasn't nice um although we suddenly had the realization that it's exactly the same as the balloon and it just kind of it 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 it, it isn't the same as the balloon it's a solid thing and it's surface tension it's not um a membrane and pressure but it actually behaves in exactly the same way as the balloon and that was an enormous kind of you know scales falling off the eyes a simplifying moment um more recently um we have increasingly been doing our own experiments um and i have to say i mean we have one result in the lab at the moment which i just don't know what to make of and which i'm you know, it is not doing what i thought it was going to do and uh i i'm excited to not know what it's doing um uh which is actually uh it's about a switchable surface texture um so we have an an lce which wants to expand but it's glued to a glass plate so it can't expand um and a really big texture appears on the top surface when it does so um which has none of the features or character that i would expect um and i i mean i don't know if this is important yet but it seems important it seems like there's something in there that we really don't understand um and i'm really kind of excited about figuring out what that's all about mm -hmm. very interesting so since we'll end, I have a few questions for you, maybe because it's the theme about how we can view something, maybe not both the feature, like elastic instability, if we just how to use them in interesting way. Do you have thought about, have you thought about other maybe feature, maybe view it in a not positive way and you try to get rid of that? Do you think besides elastic instability, do you, yeah, do you know, or do you think this other feature, maybe view it in not positive way? Yeah, no, actually. So I will. So here, something that came up, in fact, at the soft robotics workshop where uh, we met, um, uh, which I've been thinking about quite a lot since. So in liquid crystal elastomers, they, they, the, the shape transition is normally, most simply, a function of temperature, and they have a transition temperature, and uh, the transition temperature is normally regarded by the community as uncomfortably high it might be 70 degrees or 80 degrees and uh it's not kind of dangerously high but it's it's certainly not very kind of biocompatible and these are soft materials and a lot of what people would like to do with them is you know implant them into the body or around the body in various ways and that's just a bit hot um so uh a lot of people have been working very hard on bringing that temperature down um and they've been very successful they're able to now do it at 40 degrees or 35 degrees um uh but what became very uh, what someone said of the soft robotics screen uh workshop what i thought was just dead right is actually that if you want to make a soft robot actually the high transition temperature is an advantage and the higher the temperature the better 
because, uh, well, there are several reasons, actually. The first is that if you're using heating and cooling as your cycle, then the bigger the temperature, the gap, the faster you cool. And so you can, you can be faster. Uh, also, to kind of simple thermodynamics and Carnot cycles, whatever else, says that the efficiency of a system is proportional to the temperature difference, or proportional to, is, is determined by the temperature difference between kind of the hot state and the cold state. And so having a big temperature difference between a very hot thing and a very cold thing is the recipe for an efficient engine rather than an inefficient engine. Um, and I thought that was a really good point, actually. Like, this thing that the, the community has been trying to get rid of, you know, for, for several years now, actually in this other context, maybe we should actually be thinking it's a virtue and pushing it in the other direction even. Can we actually get a hotter transition temperature rather than a colder transition temperature? And I guess just you in that regard, uh, the way of thinking about the solution or the problem or what does it take maybe to see that thing, if, as you mentioned this example, what's lacking do you think that, that we can, this is interesting. You see what I mean? What does it take to achieve this mentality or the way of thinking to see this potential here? This is the right way. I, well, I think that's, that's a little out of my depth. Um, for me, what's striking about that particular piece of progress is that it's a collaborative insight, actually. I think I'm calling it an insight. Uh, I think to the person who asked the question, it was probably completely obvious. Uh, and the point was there hadn't previously been a conversation really between those two communities. Um, and I think that's certainly one common way this happens, right, is that uh, um, what one community regards as either obvious or as a flaw or as a, as a great thing, um, when you try and explain to someone else what you're doing and how it might be useful to them, they have a completely different impression about what, what's important or what's not important. Um, uh, so that's kind of an advert for you know, interdisciplinary teams and maybe not so much teams, it's just getting out there and kind of telling your story and seeing what people come and say back. Um, uh, and I think the other thing which I'm increasingly learning is um, it's a virtue in actually trying to do stuff. So not spending too long on the theory, but balancing that also against trying to actually do the thing because trying to actually do it um, forces you to face the kind of physical reality of what is and isn't important. Um, uh, whereas if you work only in the more idealised stuff, you can quite quickly you know, convince yourself that what's the important thing is not actually the important thing. Um, so those are, I mean, those are my kind of two thoughts, right? talk to a wide variety of interesting people and tell them what you do and see what they say back um, and actually do what you say you do, right? If you say you're working on this thing which will lead to X, Y, and Z, then you spend at least part of your time actually trying to do X, Y, and Z, not just being incremental on the path towards it, uh, because that will really highlight for you, you know, what the, what the real stumbling blocks are. Maybe the two last question. First one about resilience. How do you think about resilience in the material? Or, for example, you mentioned you want the, the objective, the mechanical part, like pushing or whatever. When you thought about the redundancy in the design to achieve certain objective, is it important to you to think it from a structural point of view, how you make sure this, this structure is redundant and still achieve this kind of movement like pushing or whatever functionally? Uh, yeah, so I think um, the the resilience of LCE structures is actually really rather good. Um, uh, at least you know, in the in the world of soft materials, these are covalently cross-linked elastomer networks, so they have very good fatigue and cycling properties and so forth. They do kind of do what they're supposed to do um, uh, no, many times over and rather reliably. Um, actually, the I mean, that's an interesting point. That's definitely true, and it's a very useful thing. Um, it comes at the cost of being more or less non-recyclable. So, because, and I think that uh, uh, in, 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 in the elastomer community, certainly there is definitely this kind of trade-off between durability and recyclability. And so these materials are durable, but they're not recyclable. Um, and, I'm, and I'm kind of relaxed about that. These are very high value materials that are used in small quantities. Um, 
But if it transpired that we wanted to use them to make an artificial blue whale or something, that would really start to be a problem. Um, uh, in terms of redundancy, so um, I think what you've really done there is highlighted something important, which is that uh, we're just not there yet. Right? Redundancy is the sort of thing you start to worry about when uh, you're trying to solve a real problem. Um, right? When you're trying to sell a, sell a product and you want it to hit a certain specification reliably. And the LCE community just doesn't, isn't there yet. Everything is a lab demo, right? It works once and you take a picture of it and you publish a paper. Um, uh, and that's exactly something which we do need to grapple with. Um, but I think it'd be fair to say we, we, we just haven't so far. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe the challenging, you think that's maybe part of the challenges and uh, but maybe that ask you, makes you fulfilled with what you do because it seems you're very passionate about understanding what, what, what is happening, this structure. And for you, what does maybe makes you fulfilled and aspiration when it comes to exhibit intelligence, either through structure or material or both of them? What makes you fulfilled maybe in this area of research? So I, I, the first thing I say is that I, I take a lot of pleasure in kind of explaining things that I can also see. Um, so I, you know, I, I trained in theoretical physics, but I always knew when I started doing research that I was kind of allergic to particle physics or astrophysics, and that I was interested in things more like fluid dynamics, elasticity, because they were things that I could deploy just to kind of explain the world around me and things I could hold in my hand and things I could actually do and see. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, working with LCEs is continuously rewarding on that front because they do remarkable things. Like these things jump and change shape and kind of squiggle in your hand. They really kind of appear to be alive. Um, uh, again, on a length scale, right? You, know, you could just walk into the lab and you can see it do it right there in front of you. Um, uh, so I enjoy that a lot. Um, I, um, I also have a great kind of generic pleasure in understanding things. Um, and for me, understanding things normally means boiling them down to something really simple. Um, I'm not sure that this field is particularly prone to that, right? I think that uh, I could have had that enjoyment in a lot of different fields, um, but definitely we do have that here, um, right? You can see it do something big and remarkable, like I don't know, jump up in the air, and then you can explain why it's done so, you know, with a, with, with a few lines and a, and a, and a couple of drawings. Um, um, so I think, yeah, for me, I would say those two things. Are fine. I like the things I can see and kind of tactilely interact with, and I like to understand things simply. And this this field is really kind of providing both of those for me. Um, and I guess maybe I'd also throw in there that although I'm is that I like biology. I, I'm not in any sense a biologist. Um, I'm not a trained biologist, um, but I, uh, I've i always enjoyed biology um, and marveling at what biology has given us. Um, and this provides a forum uh, to try and copy that and to spend time thinking about why that works so well, uh, which has always been something that I've enjoyed. Wonderful. Maybe I'll ask a question. If there isn't maybe advice was given to you and was a life changing, maybe it's your career or life, and stick to your mind, a life changing advice. Life changing advice. I, uh, I, I don't know if this is life changing, but I think what I would say to, uh, to young people in, you know, in research um, is, I would spend much longer worrying about the teams you'll be working in and the people who will be supervising your work than I would worrying about the project itself. Um, there's a very clear, like, how much of a kind of a good elevator pitch you can give for a project is not a very good measure of how good the science is anyway. Um, what you want to flourish is you know, supervisors who will invest time and effort in you and have a track record of doing good stuff. Um, uh, and I think so. That's, you know, that's my kind of advice to people who are 
moving through that stage is um, put the emphasis on the people, not on the project, um, uh, uh, and find the people that will teach you interesting things that will develop you as a person. Um, and don't rush for independence. Now, you will get there, um, and you need to get there in the end. Um, but it's not, no, there's no need to rush. Actually, the more time you spend and the more tricks you learn before you do that, the, the stronger you will be with.